the things that I'm focusing on early in a mix, midway through a mix, even three quarters of the way through the mix are not the kinds of things that a mix bus compressor helps me with in any way. Mostly because I just rely on mix bus compression for density. Welcome to Kush After Hours. My name is Gregory Scott. Tonight, part three in a series of how I break the rules every time. When I say rules, I'm talking about things that the internet would have you believe are things that you should be doing or the ways that you should be doing it. I have lost track of the number of times that I have seen or heard somebody saying something to the effect of, you have to mix into a mix bus compressor. Meaning you got to put the compressor on either at the beginning of the mix or very early on because it changes the balances. It changes the relationships of sounds. And so when you're mixing, you can push into it. You can swell things. It'll push back. You need to know how that's going to work. Drive the kick drum up a little harder. It gets eaten up. You need to compensate for that. First of all, that's all true. Everything there is all true in terms of how a compressor responds on the mix, the effects that it has, and why it might be necessary for you to put it on at the beginning or very early in a mix. But the thing is, it might not work for you to do it that way. And I say that because it does not work for me to do it that way. Every single time that I've tried that, and I've tried it more times than I care to admit because it means I was just listening to the voice of other people out there saying every time I slap a mix bus compressor on early in the mix, at the beginning of the mix, even like 70% into the mix, what ends up happening is I end up fighting the compressor. I like to push balances aggressively. I like to do big automation rides. I like to swell my things up in the transitions and have them spill over and cascade and collapse. And I'm going to talk about all that kind of stuff in future episodes. But for now, I just want to talk about how, for my mixing style, which I would consider to be aggressive, a mix bus compressor anywhere in the formative stages of the mix is my enemy. It just works against me. Part of that is because when I'm mixing and I'm shaping a song and getting it together, I'm not really listening for things like glue. I'm not, I don't really care about glue so much. What I'm listening for are the arrangement choices that I've made and how those translate into the mix. I want to know that my dynamics are in place. So if I've got an intro that's sitting here and it's this big and then it hits the verse and sounds empty out and fall away and it clears into a more open space and whatnot, I need to feel that happening in the mix. Now, if the kick drum is not quite tucked up in there with the bass guitar yet, and the snare drum's poking out a little too far, and there's like the acoustic guitars are just a little bit too like strumming at me, that's okay. So I'm just trying to get like the shape of the spaces together. I want my front to back, my left to right sorted out. I want to get my movement, my contrast, those kinds of things in place. The things that I'm focusing on early in a mix midway through a mix, even three quarters of the way through the mix, are not the kinds of things that a mix bus compressor helps me with in any way. Mostly because I just rely on mix bus compression for density. Density, it doesn't really affect anything else. If you think about what density is, is packing a sound field in just tighter. It's a more solid mass, right? So that's pulling the bottom up, pushing the top down, bringing the back forward a little bit, bringing the front back a little bit. All these things, this packing of things in, that's that's how I use mix bus compression. I'm not using it to sort of counterbalance my moves. I'm not using it as a form of glue. I can glue mixes fairly well without any processing on the mix bus. That's just my style. That's not a brag. It doesn't make me a better mix engineer than people who need to mix into a mix bus compressor to get their sound. This is just workflow. Right? What I'm saying to you is that there's this really overwhelmingly popular idea out there on, on especially on mix bus compression but mix processing in general there's a thing i think it's called top-down mixing where you put all of your mix processing in place the idea being you do your high shelf up here and you do a little bit of low mid cut there and a little bit of bump on the low lows and you get your 1.5 or 2 to 1 or even 4 to 1 and your ssl auto release happening and all these things. you get all that in place first then you have to do less processing on the channels and again that's probably completely true for anybody who says that that's true for them. But the thing is, it doesn't work for me. If I put a high shelf up, if I do stuff, here's my, 
back this up. I said that I fight the mixed bus compressor. I'll also fight a mixed bus EQ. And what I mean by that is that if I put a high shelf on the mix and I turn it up, it doesn't matter. 1 dB, 8 dB, whatever. I'm going to mix into that and my ear, my ears are so freaking consistent at this point in time. I will mix my sonic signature regardless of what that EQ is doing. So if that EQ is cranking up the top end, I'm going to bring down the top end on all of my channels to compensate for that, right? So that doesn't work for me. What works for me instead and what might work for you, I really, really like having nothing mixing wide open on the mix bus and seeing how far I can get every aspect of my mix without anything, without any help on that mix bus. And then when I've got it like, okay, this is as tight as I can get it. This is as much as I can harmonize the kick and the bass and the drums all together, getting them moving as a solid instrument. This is as much as I can get that vocal tucked in there without crushing it too hard. And it's still kind of doing a little bit too much of this pumping out there. The high frequencies maybe need a little bit of a gentle softening along with everything else because if I just soften the high frequencies on the drum bus then they just feel a little dark and all the, the vocal S's are popping through too much then at that point in time so I want to preserve the relationship of all the highs but just lift them up a little bit. So I get the mix as far as I can wide open on the mix bus and then I start bringing in my mix bus processing. Usually the first thing that I will do is some small amount of saturation just to help hug the bottom, add a little bit more harmonic energy and, and sparkle to things. And then that will inform a little bit of EQ. I'll throw an EQ on there and I will uh, listen to what's going on because of the saturation. Maybe I need to restore a little bit of a bump at 30 hertz, way down there. Maybe I need to restore a little bit of a bump at, at 100 hertz and pull a little 200 down and get just to, sh just to shift the focus of the lows. Now that I've added all these harmonics that are singing in my mud zone, I gotta pull the mud down a little bit and a little bit of a bump in the warmth to compensate for that. I don't know, it's all case by case. These are just some of the things that I often do. After that, yeah, I have saturation, then I'll have an EQ, or these days I have an EQ that saturates, hint, hint. Then I will insert and go out to the racks. Currently, my mix bus looks like I have a prototype Kush processor, which all it does is coloration. So more saturation and distortion. It also has a very distinct timbre to it. So it adds a very sweet, shimmery, sparkly presence at 8K. I, just, I cannot get this effect in the box. Get the right amount of juice happening on that. That's all that box does. And then I send it along to these things that you're looking at here. This is my a designs chain of glory if you've never used a designs hardware this is i don't hate to tease people who are never going to be able to afford this crap i didn't actually pay for these because a designs as you may know is a cush partner so these were generously perma loaned to me um you find gear designers do that for each other everybody's loaning everybody else stuff and it's just perpetual anyway i'm spoiled the point is a designs for my money is about smooth man their stuff is just like liquid silky smooth it's not bright it's not dark it's not colored it's not rock and roll it's not api grind it's not neve crunch it's just ah uh, just liquid silver i love that sound on my mix and the tiniest little things nail compressor maybe it's just doing this because they call it a nail compressor it's really a limiter Fast limiting, just a little bit more on those drum peaks. It's not reacting to anything else. It's not gluing my mix together because my mix is glued, right? Then it moves on to the hammer and the A-Designs pull tech. And the hammer is an interesting thing. The Kush plugin, I love it. I use it all the time. But half the time when I use the hammer plugin, I need a second hammer plugin because it's only three bands. And I could always be like, why? Why is this EQ designed like this? Until Peter loaned me the pull tech. And then I was like, oh. I don't know if this was the intention, but very much the hammer pairing with a pull tech on the mix bus. Those things complement each other amazingly. So if you have the Kush hammer plugin, you can use any plugin that does a pull tech style. Probably be coming out with ours eventually, but for now, use the inferior one that you have. And but they partner so well because what the pull tech does, those lows and the highs, the hammer's got all these various flavors of mid-range. It's also got the tips, the ends. It's not generally where I use it, although the 10K on the hammer is magical. Go through that chain. Now I've got from the Kush prototype box and the 
he designed stuff on the mix. I've got so smooth of a texture. All that digital shit is gone. I was able to push the high frequencies in ways that I'm not comfortable doing on a mix with plugins, bumping up the low lows, taking a little bit more out of the low mids. Analog just has this beautiful way of, of adjusting the low mids. You can take a little bit out and you don't lose weight. You don't lose authority. It doesn't sound thin. It just sounds clearer. It's amazing. Comes back into the box after that stuff. And then I will do usually a bit more zealous compression, usually with the Novatron, sometimes with AR1 or Celica, but usually with the Novatron because it's clear and I don't want to add any more color. So I'll turn the transformers down on the Novatron. I'm in mix mode, which is two to one. And then I just dig in with 180 or 100 millisecond release and I will dig in until I'm over compressing the mix because I want to hear what it's like to have density and no dynamics. And I'm just, I, I live with that density for a minute, get my ears adjusted to it. I hit bypass, it goes away. And suddenly the mix that I thought was glued and sounded good, it feels a little too lifeless. It feels a little too empty, right? So it's a little unprocessed. And then I start working my averages and I'm like, okay, bring the compressor back in, back that threshold off until I start to lose that quality of density and urgency and regain the sort of openness and clarity and transient impact and, and pure punch of the unprocessed mix, the uncompressed mix. And it's somewhere right on that line. There's a line. Oh, I find that line. It just gives me tremendous pleasure. But I'll find that line where I'm like, okay, bypass it. That's clearly just not, it's not exciting enough. It's not finished enough. It doesn't quite sound like a record. Put it in. Mm. Okay, now I've got that excitement and that zing factor, but I've lost some of the size. I mean, the more you compress a mix, the more you lose that size. Turn it up. You're compressing a mix and you're A-B in like this. Turn it up. When you put that compressor in, suddenly that big, exciting mix just becomes too noisy, too much of a wall of sound. You've lost the spaces in between, the transient hits, the crest factor's gotten too small. Back that threshold off a little more. 2 dB of reduction at the most. Sometimes a lot less than that. Sometimes I just want to see that needle move up and recover fully on the, on the transients. And then the last thing in my chain will be an inflator. And again, inflator is just, it's a wave shaper, AKA a distortion box. And you can use it one of two ways. You can use inflator in the positive direction, which will reduce peaks and increase the RMS energy, or you can pull into the negative space on it, and that will increase peak energy and decrease the RMS. So you get an even punchier, uh, less compressed sounding mix. So if you've got a mix, if you're a mastering person, if you printed a mix and it's a little too compressed, inflator can restore some of those dynamics. It's really a magical plugin. I have a high curve on the inflator, it's like 30, 35%, and the effect level is somewhere between 20 and 30%. And I'm keying in usually to the low frequencies when I'm listening to the inflator, because uh, it will change the sort of growl and urgency of the bass for me and the density factor down low. When the curve is that high, 38%, it's really working the ends of the spectrum more aggressively. At least that's my understanding, that's how I hear it. So, saturation into a compensatory EQ, which also sets up for the analog chain, which is saturation, limiting, just a tiny amount of limiting, tiny little tweaks on an EQ where I'm bumping the bottom, doing something to the low mids, usually pulling them out, or I'm pushing a little bit of energy around 800 or something, 800 on a mix, tangent here. Howie Weinberg, I think, one time I was in a session with him, he was mastering a song of mine. He said, 800 hertz for me is the foundation of the mid-range and that always stuck with me i'm like oh, the foundation of the mid-range so if you've got a mix and everything is sounding good but it just doesn't feel like it's got sea legs to stand on it's not lows and highs that are the problem not the issue there a little bit of shaping a little bit of bump wide bump preferably for me around 800 hertz on a mix not much a little goes a long way with mix eq magical anyway that's what i'm doing there a lot of times i will soften up 5k with the hammer i'll just pull a little 5k out or a little 3.5k get more of the softening happening and then i'm putting it back higher up with the pull tech 12k or 16k that's it sometimes the hammer's adding 10k in which case i will then go to the pull tech pull a little 10k back out and add some 16k back in or i'm pulling 20k out with the pull tech and adding 16k in it's just but all of these moves are tiny and that's because my mix is set up and Really, I don't have to have any of this processing. I could hand you my mix without any of this mix plus processing. Half of you would probably think it sounds fantastic. It does sound fantastic, but it's just not quite finished. 
So my mix bus chain is about getting a finished sound. It's not about modifying my balances or doing anything in terms of glue or transient shaping in a way that meaningfully impacts my mixing work. And so for that reason, I 100% of the time break the rule of having my mix bus processing in place from the outset because I don't use mix bus processing as a mixing tool. I use it as a finishing tool, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, you're on your own. I'm just kidding. You're never on your own to Kush After Hours. My name's Gregory Scott. Thanks for listening to me ramble, and we will talk to you soon.